please turn to the psalm that we just sung, Psalm 22. pray one more time and ask God to give us understanding of his word. Lord, we are grateful this morning for the written word of God. Uh, just as we learned uh, last week, the, the heavens speak to us. They declare your glory and your majesty and your might and your power and your wisdom. But it's in the scriptures that we learn of our sinfulness. We learn of the redemption that is ours in Christ Jesus. It is in the scriptures that we turn to a passage like we are turning to this morning and we see Christ in all of his glory and all of his grace and in all of his power. And that would be my prayer this morning, O oh Father, that we would see Christ in the pages of scripture in these moments. We pray in our Savior's name. Amen. Psalm 22, beginning to read at verse 1. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from saving me from the words of my groaning? Oh my God, I cry by day, but you do not answer, and by night, but I find no rest. Yet you are holy, enthroned on the praises of Israel, and you our fathers trusted. They trusted, and you delivered them. To you they cried and were rescued, and you they trusted. And were, not, and were not put to shame. But I am a worm and not a man, scorned by mankind and despised by the people. All who see me mock me. They make mouths at me. They wag their heads. He trusts in the Lord. Let him deliver him. Let him rescue him, for he delights in him. Yet you are he who took me from the womb. You made me trust you at my mother's breasts. On you was I cast from my birth, and from my mother's womb you have been my God. Be not far from me, for trouble is near, and there is none to help. Many bulls encompass me, strong bulls of Bashan surround me. They open wide their mouths at me like a ravening and roaring lion. I am poured out like water, and all my bones are out of joint. My heart is like wax, it is melted within my breast. My strength is dried up like a potsherd, and my tongue sticks to my jaws. You lay me in the dust of death, for dogs encompass me. A company of evildoers encircles me. They have pierced my hands and feet. I can count all my bones, they stare and gloat over me, they divide my garments among them, and for my clothing they cast lots. But you, O Lord, do not be far off. O you, my help, come quickly to my aid. Deliver my soul from the sword, my precious life from the power of the dog. Save me from the mouth of the lion. You have rescued me from the horns of the wild oxen. I will tell of your name to my brothers in the midst of the congregation. I will praise you. You who fear the Lord, praise him. All you offspring of Jacob, glorify him and stand in awe of him, all you offspring of Israel. For he has not despised or abhorred the affliction of the afflicted, and he has not hidden his face from him, but is heard when he cried to him. From you comes my praise in the great congregation. My vows I will perform before those who fear him. The afflicted shall eat and be satisfied. Those who seek him shall praise the Lord. May your hearts live forever. All the ends of the earth shall remember and turn to the Lord, and all the families of the nations shall worship before you. For kingship belongs to the Lord, and he rules over the nations. All the prosperous of the earth eat and worship before him shall bow all who go down to the dust, even the one who could not keep himself alive. Posterity shall serve him, 
It shall be told of the Lord to the coming generation. They shall come and proclaim his righteousness to a people yet unborn that he has done it. This is the word of the Lord. Well, we come again this morning to a rather lengthy psalm. Two weeks ago we dealt with Psalm 18, and if you will recall, that psalm had 50 verses. And today we're going to try to cover all 31 verses of Psalm 22. So that's quite a, a task this morning. Obviously, we'll have to take the big picture look of this psalm. Uh, now, this always presents a challenge to a preacher because each verse of this psalm is filled with meaning. Just for an example of this, uh, on Good Friday, I plan to bring a sermon just from verse 1. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from saving me from the words of my groaning? And as you know, this very verse was quoted by Christ on the cross. But the psalm also presents a, another challenge for the pastor or the Bible teacher or preacher. And it's this. It's a challenge that every preacher faces in the psalms. Are we dealing with a type in this passage? That is, is David a type of Christ or is this pure predictive prophecy that is found in Psalm 22. In other words, David is speaking prophetically, not primarily about himself, but about the Lord Jesus. Or, and this is my view, is it is a combination of the two, that both of these things are going on within this psalm. David indeed is serving as a type of the Lord Jesus Christ, but as we're going to see as we get into the psalm, there is predictive prophecy here as well. So David describes, as you can obviously see in the psalm, a time of great suffering in his life. Uh, we note this suffering or this humiliation in verses 1 through 21, the first part of the psalm. He describes this time of just obviously excruciating trial that he was facing. So we see this, but in the last part of the psalm, he goes on to describe God's rescue of him from his foes. Uh, this begins in verse uh, 22, and it goes through the end of the chapter. He speaks of deliverance from the trial. Uh, he speaks of singing corporately in the great congregation. And not only that, he predicts a worldwide worship of Jehovah by the nations. Now, I have a very simple sermon title this morning. It's just this, Humiliation and Exaltation. That pretty much summarizes the psalm for us. So we're going to look at the humiliation of David and of Christ, and then we will look at the exaltation of David and of Christ as well. So the humiliation of David in verses 1 through 21. And let us note a number of things, actually five things concerning David's humiliation. Notice first of all, this humili humiliation involved a sense of abandonment by God. You see this in verses 1 through 2. He obviously felt forsaken of the Lord. God seemed to be far away. And notice the passion and the desperation in this. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from saving me from the words of my groaning? You can see in this passage that David had lost a sense of the presence of God or the nearness of God. And in all likelihood, uh, all of us have been there at one time or another in our lives and would, ma would make a, a similar cry. Notice, secondly, his humiliation involved mocking from the people. You see this in verses 6 through 8. Not only had God abandoned him, and he had this sense of loss before the Lord, um, but people were mocking him. Men were scorning him, and this had to do with David's faith. Notice what they were saying. He trusts in the Lord. <laughs> let him, that is, let the Lord deliver him. Let him rescue him, for he delights in him. So the people that were mocking David knew something of his faith and used that against him. Notice thirdly, his humiliation involved persecution from his enemies. You see this in verses 12 through 13 and in verses 16 through 18. And it is vivid and it is startling language. 
Uh, many bulls encompass me. Strong bulls of Bashan surround me. Bashan was a region of Samaria that was noted for its healthy livestock. These, uh, and so David is likening his, his enemies to these bulls that are surrounding him. They open wide their mouths at me. They are like ravening in a roaring lion. So David is experiencing persecution from his enemies. But notice he is experiencing excruciating physical suffering. You see this in verses 14 through 18. I am poured out like water, and all my bones are out of joint. My heart is like wax. It is melted within my breast. My strength is dried up like a potsherd, and my tongue sticks to my jaws. You lay me in the dust of death. In all likelihood, David is describing here starvation, and he is describing dehydration. His humiliation involved not only a problem with his soul, but a problem with his body. And then notice his humiliation involved cries for deliverance. You see this in verses 3 through 5, verses 9 through 11, and verses 19 through 21. And David was a believer in God. He was not an enemy of God. You see him appealing to this in verses 9 through 10. These are wonderful verses that we could come back at a later time that speak of the covenant relationship that God has with the children of believers. Notice what it says, yet you are he who took me from the womb you made me trust you at my mother's breast. On you was I cast from birth, and from my mother's womb you had been my God. Notice the covenant language there. David is saying, my struggle makes no sense because I know the Lord, and I've known him for a long time, and I've lived faithfully before him. And now this excruciating trial and humiliation has come my way. Now we do not know from First and Second Samuel when this psalm was penned. Uh, you'll know that the books of First and Second Samuel record the life of David, and when you search them, they provide no clues as to the historical circumstances of Psalm 22. But David is speaking throughout in the first person. He is talking about himself. He is talking about a difficulty he is facing. He cannot be lying to us. He is speaking under inspiration, and we must conclude that he is describing for us this terrible humiliation in his life. Now let me make an obvious statement of application this morning. Godliness does not exempt one from pain and suffering in this life. Did you hear that? If you didn't, let me say it again. Godliness does not exempt one from pain and from suffering in this life. If you have imbibed the prosperity gospel, spit it out. It is a delusion. It is a delusion. It will not prepare you for the difficult realities of life in general and of the Christian life in particular. There's a very good reason why Jesus said when he was preparing those early disciples for their discipleship, for their walk with him, that he told them to deny themselves and take up what? A cross and follow. Have you done that? Have I done that? 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 21, and I emphasize this this morning because it's a message that we do not hear enough in our day. I'm not saying Christianity is all doom and gloom. We join as we have done this morning, and we sing great hymns of praise because we know of the faithfulness of our God. But at the same time, we confess to one another that life is difficult and life is hard. And we can have times that we feel just like David, as if God has abandoned us and he has gone away on a vacation and left us alone. And Psalms like this prepare us for those difficult days 
that when these things occur, we are not lone rangers. The people of God have gone through them in the past. They are going through them in the present. They will go through them in the future. Peter says in his epistle, for to this you have been called because Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example so that you follow his steps. So that when the suffering comes, you walk through it by his grace, holding his hand, knowing that your hand is in the hand of the one who holds you fast and who will never, ever let you go. The humiliation of David. But notice also in David serving as a type for us this morning and also this whole idea of predictive prophecy, the humiliation of Christ. This is an amazing psalm. Uh, what you have here is a point-by-point -point description of Christ's crucifixion. And the similarities here are nothing short of amazing. Notice, first of all, the humiliation involved, just like David, a sense of abandonment by God. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? We read of that, didn't we, earlier in Matthew chapter 27. This is the very cry of Christ upon his cross as he was suffering for us. It is his cry of dereliction as the wrath of God was poured out upon him. His humiliation involved a sense of abandonment by God and his humiliation involved mocking from the people, verses 6 through 8. Remember they cried out in Matthew 27 and verse 29, Hail, King of the Jews! They cried it in scorn. And they said also, he saved others. He cannot save himself. They shouted this very line in Matthew 27 and verse 42. His humiliation involved mocking from the people and it was for you and it was for me. His humiliation involved persecution from his enemies, verses 12 through 13. In verses 16 through 18, these verses remind us of that fateful day on Calvary. It's almost like David was there himself. As we read this passage, it's almost like we are there at Calvary as well. Hearing the cries, hearing the screams of the hostile mob crying out, crucify him, crucify him, persecution from his enemies. And then Christ's humiliation involved excruciating physical suffering. Our power went out the other morning about, I don't know what time it was, about 5.30. And the house started getting cold and I said to myself, just, I, I couldn't endure that hardly for 30 minutes. And yet Christ endured this for us excruciating physical suffering. He was poured out. His bones were out of joint. He was dehydrated and emaciated. He cried out, I thirst. His hands and feet were pierced through by nails. He hung on the cross naked and humiliated for us. Verse 18 that you see, they divide my garments among them and for my clothing they cast lots. This was fulfilled literally in John 19, 24, when the soldiers cast lots for his tunic. And then finally, Christ's humiliation involved cries for deliverance. Verses 3 through 5, 9 through 11, and verses 19, 19 through 21. We remember here his cry from Gethsemane, my father, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me. Deliver me from this hour, the Lord Jesus said. But you remember he went on to pray, nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. And aren't we glad he said that? So the humiliation of Christ, a point-by-point -point description of his crucifixion. 
This doesn't happen a lot. I tend to think that it will happen a whole lot when true revival comes to this church and comes to this nation. But occasionally after a sermon or after the Lord's Supper, someone will come up to me with tears in their eyes and they will say, you know, during your sermon or during the Lord's Supper, I realized that the cross, it was for me. It was for me. He loved us and he gave himself for us. Little wonder Matthew Bridges penned that hymn and when he said, Awake my soul and sing of him who died for thee and praise him as the matchless king through all eternity. All eternity will not be enough time to give thanks to Christ for what he has done on his cross for us. The humiliation of Christ. But notice the exaltation of David. The story gets better, or the psalm takes a dramatic turn at this point. Uh, David's cries for deliverance, as you see beginning in verse 22, or really back to verse 21, the last part of verse 21, they were answered. David, in a figurative sense, was resurrected from the dead. We see his exaltation in the deliverance itself in verse 24. For he has not despised or abhorred the affliction of the afflicted, and he has not hidden his face from him, but has heard when he cried to him. So we see that David is exalted. He is delivered from this excruciating trial. Notice also we see his exaltation in the congregation of God's people. You see this in verses 22 through verse 26. It seems that after this deliverance, David returns to the congregation of the people of God in corporate worship. And he returns with a message of praise and a message of encouragement. Verse 24, again, he has not despised or abhorred the affliction of the afflicted. And then also in verse 26, the afflicted shall lead and be satisfied. Those who seek him shall praise the Lord. May your hearts live forever. So we see his exaltation, David's that is, in the deliverance itself. And then in the fact that he returns to the corporate people of God with these songs of praise. And then finally we see his exaltation in the nations. You see this in verses 27 through 31. The news of David's deliverance, it, it traveled to the surrounding nations and even to the ends of the earth. And we, in some sense of the word, are fulfilling this prediction by having our Bibles open this morning and reading it. We are listening to David tell his story to us, to us thousands of years later. And we learn that our great God comes to the aid and to the rescue of his people. God comes to the aid and the rescue of his people. Isn't that your story this morning? God always comes through. There are times of groaning, there are times of intense physical suffering, but God fulfills his promises to us. Darkness can descend upon Christians and remain for a long time. There is a valley of the shadow of death. The hymn writer says, when through fiery trials thy pathway shall lie. But generally speaking, the Christian life, it is a life of advance. It is a life of progress. It is the story of God pouring out his grace upon us in those difficult times when sometimes we wonder if he is even there. He is behind the scenes working, sustaining, empowering us even when we are unaware. And then days later, weeks later, months later, we reflect back on that time and we see the hand of God. And we praise him and we thank him for what he has done. John Bunyan's great allegory, Pilgrim's Progress, picks up on this so well. There is the slew of despond, but there is the interpreter's house. There is the battle with Apollyon, but there are the delectable mountains. 
There is the city of destruction, but there is the celestial city to which he is headed. Dear people, that is our future, and God is leading us every step of the way. And so when God delivers, sing, praise, rejoice. And this is one of the values of corporate worship. And I'm thankful for those that are watching us live stream, but there is nothing like being here. When you come back with God's people on Sunday morning after a difficult week and you sing these praises to him, and we all come together and we all agree, and we say, yes, it is true. This Christian faith is real. Christ has died. Christ is ruling and reigning at God's right hand. He has his hand upon me. And there's nothing that can separate us from the love of God that is found in Christ Jesus our Lord. And we get to get back to this place and tell one another about it. The exaltation of David. And then secondly here, the exaltation of Christ. In closing, we see Christ's exaltation and his deliverance from death like David. God raised Christ from the dead, but in Christ's case, it was a literal resurrection of body and soul. He delivered Christ from all of his and our enemies. And he, God the Father, delivered Christ and us from the sting of death. I love the way Peter puts it in Acts chapter 2 and verse 24. God raised him up, loosing the pangs of death because it was not possible for him to be held by it. Christ's exaltation and his deliverance from death. And then we see Christ's exaltation where? In the congregation of God's people. Verse 22, I will tell of your name to my brothers. And in the midst of the congregation, I will praise you. Verse 25, from you comes my praise in the great congregation. My vows I will perform before those who fear him. Turn if you would and let us see how this passage of scripture is look, used in Hebrews chapter 2. Hebrews chapter 2. Beginning to read it at verse 10. Like David Christ returns to his congregation, to his people announcing victory, and he sings with his people as they sing. Notice verse 10 of Hebrews 2, For it was fitting that he, that is God the Father, for whom and by whom all things exist, in bringing many sons to glory, that's us who know Christ, should make the founder of their salvation, that is the Lord Jesus, perfect through suffering. For he who sanctifies God the Father and those who are sanctified, that is us if we know him, all have one source, that is why he is not ashamed, that is, Christ is not ashamed to call us his brothers. To look at us and say, that's my family. Saying, I will tell of your name to my brothers in the midst of the congregation, I will sing your praise. I, that is Christ, will tell your name, that is the name of God the Father, to my brothers, that is us, the people of God, in the midst of the congregation, that is here, that is today, that is every Christian congregation that has ever met since the first century. And Christ says, I will sing your praise in the midst of the congregation. Has this ever dawned on us? Do we realize this? There is an unseen guest in our worship services. And it is the Lord Jesus Christ by his spirit. And he's singing with us. He's here. He is present. He loves to hear the songs of his victory. He loves to hear the songs of our struggles. 
He loves to hear it when we honestly confess our sins before Him. He loves it when we bow down before Him and acknowledge His kingship and His honor and His glory. Matthew 18, 20, For where two or three are gathered in my name, there am I among them. Has this reality dawned on us? We stand to sing in our worship services at times and we think that Christ is far away. And he says, no, I'm standing with you and I am singing with you. He visits us through his word and through his spirit. He draws near to us in the sacraments. What a gracious Savior is the Lord Jesus Christ. He could have said, I've died for you. You're forgiven. You're on your way to heaven. But I'll see you when you get there. But he says, no. I will tell of your name to my brothers in the midst of the congregation. I will sing your praise. He says, no, I will come and I will visit you along your journey and along the way. Glory to God. What a great Savior is ours. Let us pray. Our Father, we thank you for this psalm and for its reminder of what Christ went through so that we might be forgiven, so that we might be your people. And I pray that as we come to the Lord's table this morning that you would give to us a very real sense of our sin, but also a very real sense of the depth of your love for us. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believes in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. O oh, Father, as we come to the table, may we think of Christ, may we think of his humiliation, may we be reminded of his glory, and may we come, Father, confessing our sin and putting our faith and trust in him. We pray in our Savior's name.